uh, I chose the topic systemic TA for a way to deal with TA concepts as many of you do as well. I heard other chose um, Keith, for example, called it co-creative TA. This would be a, a term I also could have chosen. In Germany, systemic TA, that's that's a more common uh, term, also including uh, constructivism and co-creative things. And I think Keith is beginning to see a difference between co-creative and systemic. Ah, okay. So that's a question of choosing names and defining what this meant with that. And transactional an analysis. Um, I developed most of these concepts on the basis of TA tradition and TA concepts. I will indicate where I, I'm aware of that. But I, I used it for 20 years now without naming them TA. And we do not run a TA program at our <laughs> institute, uh, but TA is implicitly present in many concepts and in professional culture. And for me, especially professional culture of TA, how we developed it further, is one of the most valuable things of TA. But if you are asked, what is TA? Nobody would say professional culture. Everybody would say ego states, triangles, arrows, and so on. And I hope one day we change that. The programmatic self-definition of TA. In Germany, we had a professor on comparative psychotherapy, Leonard Schlegel, and he translated, he, he called his book Transaktionale Analysis. This means not analysis of transactions, it means analysis by transactions. And I love this. This means how people create reality through communication. So TA understands this way is the studying of creating reality. But uh, very specifically cutting it down to communication units by which reality is created or what are the results of understanding of reality. So what frame of reference leads to what kind of communication. So this interrelation. And if you understand it like this, it's for me it's uh, very comfortable to call it TA. It would not be comfortable if that means uh, the row of classical concepts. So when I first presented my concepts, and this is also the title, I, I believe, of the article in the THA after I've receiving the award is a role concept of TA and other approaches to personality, encounter and co-creativity in non-clinical fields. Also in clinical fields. So it's a kind of meta-concept that can be specified to different fields. And for me this uh, will not be for all times the four applications fields we have now. That's that's only a way to sort it out. Maybe that's sometimes not very useful. In Brazil, there is another field. Mm -hmm. The official field right? of jurisprudence. How is it called? Jurisprudence. Ah, jurisprudence. Wonderful. Yeah. So, the legal Yeah. Law. Oh, 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 oh. Justice. So. Oh. I'm relating to TA as a one way to think about professionality. That's our, our main focus. And we have a, had a long discussion with the German Coaching Association. What coaching, could coaching be a profession? And uh, what we discussed is that the theory of profession is also changing, but it's saying it's one major relationship between human beings and, and the world. So the relationship between human beings and body is medical health. Between human being and jurisprudence, that's being uh, 
uh, um, a law in all these professions. If this is a kind of definition, what then? Uh, when then can coaching be a profession on its own? And I define uh, it can be a profession if it on its own when it defines the relationship between a person and profession and between a person and organization. There is no other profession who is uh, integrating leaf, uh, integrating all the concepts in order to focus on this major relationship between human beings and world. So, person on, and profession, that's the personal professional life, and we did the, the, the exercise, the metaphor exercise on this focus. In the last workshop I did the uh, exercise on the focus person and organization, to find some images about you, to find images about an organization, how they match to each other. So for me, uh, professional competence is in coaching or in these eras is competence in understanding how people relate to professions and to organizations and vice versa, how organizations relate to people and professions relate to people. And this is beyond single classical disciplines like psychology or law or something like that, because it's integrating many aspects. So you don't have to decide whether you are clinical or not clinical. Mm -hmm. There are clinical aspects certainly in the relationship between an individual and a professional uh, life development. Or there are clinical aspects in the question what structures an organization could adopt to offer people healthy life while working. Mm -hmm. But you certainly are not a clinical member because of that. But you should relate to all these things. And so I tried to to define a variety of integration of concepts and approaches beyond the classical schools in order to serve these two major dimensions. So uh, in the last 30 years, I've developed a lot of concepts, or further developed classical con uh, concepts, and I give you a short overview on that, and we, in the last workshop we managed almost to go through everything. Briefly, this workshop is not uh, to, to train you on the specific aspects, but to give you an understanding how it is meant, to compare it with the US, and if you want to use more of it, then we could find other ways to do that. So, we just started with uh, introduction and uh, systemic perspectives. Then later on we will have some communication models. And these are um, communication models that help to understand the meeting of realities, to build up shared realities. And these are concepts on dialoguing between methodical um, <coughs> conscious level of understanding and intuitive unconscious level of understanding, how we talk right now. And one way, and these, all these models are designed uh, without any psychological knowledge. So that you can use this language in all fields without being trained in or even being interested in classical psychology. And one metaphor that serves a lot to do this is point three, the theater metaphor. And as I read now in the articles in the script book, uh, uh, Burns often used this metaphor of uh, filming and theater and classical Greek theater. And this is a, a metaphor you can use almost everywhere in our culture at least. And people immediately have an idea how to talk about creating reality. So you can use this as a language tool. I will go into that. This is point three. We probably do this uh, three points uh, today. 
then um, we go to the role concept for what uh, I got the EBMA and the role concept is designing a person as a bundle of roles being played in the place she is in on the stages she is attracted to and so on so and the one of the role one way to use the role model is to use it as a three worlds model <coughs> it's a professional world the organizational world and the private world and this differentiation helps this basic understanding that is some kind of different focus whether you focus on person and profession and development of professional life and person of functioning in specific organizations and for example if you have a supervision and you only have half hours time it's important to know whether this person wants in the first place develop uh, his or her professional identity and understanding his or her roles and careers, or the person wants to understand his or her functioning in a specific organization. So there are also backgrounds you need to include, to understand uh, uh, the, the supervision. And um, one of the implicit ideas of humanistic psychology have been uh, if you free a person from the the eggshells uh, from its history, then the person will be free to be competent. This is true as well, to some extent, but it ignores competence as a major ingredient to be free to do good work. So uh, I include in understanding professional personality, you have to understand development of competence and competence you cannot define without context and without matching between the nature of the person and the competencies are uh, expected in contexts so personality work means working with understanding competence and matching competence to the challenges you are hired for So you see the question of personality is very much tied to challenges today and tomorrow in our society and question with logic of professions and organizations and not so much with underlying uh, private uh, mot motivations. It's not much tied to motivation and it's not my much tied to biography. It can be, but it's not habitually tied to biography. And I think it's also necessary to have concepts uh, that just can work in the present and the future. And you do not, to, uh, uh, in order to explain what you see, even if it's not working very fine, you don't have to go into, <coughs> into past stuff, or you don't have to go into the area of private motivation to have an idea what to do to make things better. And that's very different from the habitual clinical approach. Then point five is also the question about responsibility. Thank you. Uh, one of my sentences is you can design an organization as a system of responsibilities. as you can design an organization as a structure or as people or as processes you also can look at organization from the perspective how is this a network of responsibilities and then think about how is the responsibility embedded in people in structures in processes and in my view one of our biggest problems at these times is that uh, we do not have consistent understandings of what our responsibilities are nowadays. And we do not have a good culture to talk about. 
So the focus is on how can we design responsibility, and the focus is on how can we build up a culture of dialoguing on responsibility, because there is not, not, not one map for responsibility. This is different in each, from the perspective of each profession in each organization, it's different, maybe in each country or culture. So you certainly train this on specific examples of networks of responsibility, but the main thing is that you don't adopt these answers, but you know how to question when you are in, in new situations. And I hope to contribute to a language for that. You all do that. It's not, uh, I'm on the council level, I might not tell much new. What, what could be a contribution of mine is giving, uh, um, a new, in uh, developing a, a better language for yourself and for introducing with your clients and partners to talk about these topics where you have already experienced it in or have made develop in yourself. It's going back to Schiff's concept of symbiosis. I will outline how, how I first developed it. <clears throat> then I believe when people really are stuck, when teams are stuck, when organizations are stuck, they usually present an understanding of the problem that is, has inherent ideas about the situations that cannot lead to solutions. So the non-solvability is part of the trial to solve. And if that's the case, you are in a dilemma, unless you find out that you're trying to answer the wrong question or, or trying to follow the wrong order in getting free. And this is described with the dilemma concept. I got, together with Klaus Jäger, the European Scientific Award for this dilemma concept, dilemma circle concept. I think it was eight, 1987. And I still think if people really are in a mess, they very often are also into dilemma time. And if there is a dilemma, you cannot solve it from inside out. You have to get out and solve it from outside in. And I use during these days very often the metaphor of a helicopter. Mm -hmm. So we fly in, and after a while we find ourselves being caught in the dilemma. Then we go back to our helicopter and do not try to fight the dilemma. <laughs> and we fly out and look how the situation is that causes the dilemma. So we call that experimental approach to feel free at each point to fly out to meta levels and to think about how to approach anew. There's something different than working through. Then we have all the narrative TA working with intuition. I've, uh, I, I will discuss the notion of intuition, the classical one from Bern relating to Aristoteles and limitations to intuition and all these things, and I have added some aspects. What is limiting intuition as well, what was not in the consideration of Brown's <coughs> work. Uh, very, uh, especially, it says all over the time, uh, what is not underlined enough is the function of habits. We always we, we we always think that it's some kind of motivation developed by significant experiences, personal trauma, confronting um, personal interests with society or something that causes tension from which we come to some kind of conclusions. Yes, that's true as well. But I guess most of the limiting understanding of reality just develop habitually. But habits do not, cannot be dramatically worked through. 
says mm-hmm. this is why we may not be so much interested in in habits mm-hmm. but habits are maybe even more limiting as all uh, drama car together mm-hmm. and if you want uh, are you heading for changing cultures you should find an approach to dealing with habits mm-hmm. I, I was wondering, uh, when you're talking about habits, yes. uh, are you, do, do you mean literally habits, everyday habits, or are you referring to uh, systematic adaptations that we have grown to know throughout both. our life? Both, both. Okay, so Just what, what seems naturally to be real, uh, and, it, and you, you do not get aware that this was somehow a decision, Automatic. and you could do it differently. So, so it's detecting the, the non-shining, non, uh, all the frame of reference that are not attracting your attention, but are influencing uh, your limitations you're working in. <coughs> and, this, and besides that, very, uh, maybe we are overstressed uh, in working through um, dramatic developments of realities, and sometimes forget that even if we do this successfully, it still takes time to change habits. So even in clinical <laughs> work, I think changing habits is an important focus, but uh, it's no drama. So And so it's not easily included uh, in the interest of psychotherapists. Habits are boring. Good? Habits are boring. Yes, as long as if you don't find an interested, interesting, inspiring viewpoint to deal with them. So, background images, we did already some of this. And to work with dreams, guided imagery, metaphors and storytelling. These are all methods to do with the complexity of meaning, the multi-layered understanding of life in the dimension person-profession and person-organization. <coughs> you certainly use all these things for other uh, relationships too, but that's not my main focus. <coughs> and then there, there, there are some small pieces of personality concepts that uh, I've developed or further developed that are not part of a bigger systematic thing but usually interesting to pick up. And this is, for example, for the five drivers, I was still in five drivers, I now read there's a, a six one, take it. Uh, I, I, I've defined counter dynamics. So the opposite dynamics that hides, that discovers the counter dynamic. So I came up with an idea for it. The, the driver take it. Um, maybe it's the opposite. Doesn't matter. So leave it. But not that's not a solution. A person who is uh, like a, a, um, a hippie going around and saying leave it, he might be under the stress of the take it uh, driver, but defending against it. But the logic of his understanding of reality is the same as take it. He only, has only chosen the counter dynamic mm-hmm. and doing the opposite thing. And this is important uh, to, to diagnose if you want to work with uh, a hippie of this kind. Mm-hmm. And so I have, to, I have uh, defined uh, for all drivers counter dynamics. Uh, I've, I've written two months or three months ago to Taby Kaler because I've got his new book and I said, oh, wonderful, let's get in dialogue. I forgot to tell him that I've written on counter dynamics mm. since, I guess, 15 years ago or so. And I described that I've defined counter dynamics and very briefly outlined it. He wrote me back, it's wonderful that I'm interested in his work and where I can buy his new books and book his new uh, workshop, so this was end of the dialogue. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Too bad. Mm-hmm. There's, uh, 
Another topic says is identity beliefs. I think it's a separate thing to change on attitude, behavioral, emotional thinking level and to integrate these things in a self-definition, in a belief about yourself. It's not automatically uh, um, ending in, the, in, in changing in beliefs about yourself. It's sometimes necessary to separately work with beliefs about oneself, about identity. And I've developed uh, ways of doing that. I will present <coughs> that. And the other thing I called excitement management. Uh, people, if they want to get out of their normal uh, way of dealing with reality because they were had for something exciting, it's essential. Some go into the direction of um, getting more excitement and some things go into the direction getting less excitement. And these are two valid ways to come to essentials, but it's a problem when a couple tries both ways at a time. So these are four small pieces of personality concepts. And and then there's a chapter on professionalism. I firmly believe as if, if I enlarge the concepts of personality and creating reality in a professional world uh, to, to the question of context and content and um, and competence and matching. It even more has to be enlarged to the notion of professional communities, cultures of professional communities, of culture of professional associations. Here we are at the question of TA association. That's a because that's an important context between person and profession, because profession is very much developed by professional communities and associations. This is why uh, we, we not only should to have a person in, uh, privately develop and then hope professionally this will lead to a good success, we need to change professional culture and understanding of competence and we need uh, the frameworks around that as well as we need behind the organizations <coughs> the framework of market of society of the whole whole world so it's always an onion kind of thing and we have uh, depends on the focus in which direction we look on layers of this onion behind what we directly see and so I invite in introducing much more context than the context of psychological individual history to focus on in your work. It was Graham Barnes, a UK person who, uh, when he received his EBMA that TA as it's is at its end because you cannot deal with more than two persons with that and it deletes content it I he said it, it's it's not useful for more uh, for to work more than with two two people ah. and it deletes context mm -hmm. and it deletes content mm -hmm. And maybe I could add, or you can sub uh, to, um, include that in context, it deletes culture. Mm -hmm. And I see, if that's the case, then TA really is at its end for a general use. Mm -hmm. I try to contribute to include context, to include content, to focus not only on two persons burned in with Google Maps, but um, focusing on 
professional constellations, organizational constellations, and especially on the cultural dimensions of them. Because cultural dimensions invite people into individual, in, in shaping roles, in individual, individually understanding roles, and so on. So it's, it's a um, back and forth development. And this has to do with the question of how is our self-understanding identification as transactional analysts or as a TA association. And um, we have classical habits on that, which have to be overcome. Many of us overcome individually classical restrictions but it's it's not uh, as I said at um, at the point identity belief is is not much uh, becoming a part of our identity labels, and in order to develop professionality from a TA perspective, it's also necessary to develop professional identities and uh, self presentation to the world, and we are very much uh, stuck into classical uh, self-understanding on that. You are, does it come across what I mean with that? Mm -hmm. So all these layers are, have to do with each other. Mm -hmm. and, and this is why it is systemic. You look at the whole system and you specify as you need it at the moment because you always, you, you never can deal with everything. You have to deal with something, but you Choose, don't choose that habitually. You have to think about what to choose and how to choose with what results and from what roles and what context you are coming from. So this is the menu. Mm -hmm. Sounds interesting, Samar? Yeah. Talk about your metaphor of the bridge. Yeah. You talked about yourself being a bridge. Yes. Yeah. And so the sense I'm getting is that is that a bridge into the future or yeah. into the future. Yeah. I'm a professional witch <coughs> because witch means the one who is on the fence. It's not in and it's not out. Oh. So it's professional witchcraft <laughs> for which I <laughs> I want to offer language <laughs> and cultural elements. Hi, Lucifer. You like the notion of which? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a big topic, mm. you know, that, are, that a lot of modalities get caught in about the past and the personalities and the people that were involved in setting yeah. up things and yeah. then how to go forward yeah. and the best interest of the modality. Mm -hmm. Right. Without um, throwing babies out with bathwater and without discounting individuals that contribute, isn't yeah. it? You know, I don't yeah. think it only is in the TA world. Yeah. I think it's in many worlds. Right. Would you say? Like, yeah. 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 But isn't that also because um, there is missing the competence to think about the organisation, the modality, the profession? the system mm. and people think about individuals yeah. and they can't mm. they don't know how to put individuals in the background mm -hmm. and to be thinking mm -hmm. about actually this is about a professional yeah. system or yeah. yeah. an yeah. organisation mm. yeah you're right that's right yeah and if people haven't got that competence they will only get it if they are willing to get it mm. and if then you know, they might just like, I don't need this, yeah. mm -hmm. because they don't know they need it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or, or they are caught in, in habits. Uh, yes. So they try to use a functional model, since we have a habit. The functional model is based on a structural model, mm -hmm. and a structural model is a developmental model of private biography. Mm -hmm. And so, so they, they think they have to work with a model of private biography, also it's not necessary to work with functions. 
because this much is just habitual and trained on. And the longer you are trained as transactional analyst, the more you get competent and the more there is a danger that you will be caught in habits of your professional mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's to do with investment as well. I mean, you've invested yeah. an awful long time getting to the place where your habit. Yes, and true. the investment tells you it must be right, otherwise I maybe yeah. might have been misinvested. And then presumably that then feeds into the identity. You know, that's right. when you have to get down into right. looking at the identity. Right. And one of the reasons because I said we only have two years programs. We do not have any longer programs. Why is it? Why is it? Because um, well, it people, oh. yeah, because we are working with uh, people who are doing training elsewhere as well. Yeah. <coughs> and I firmly believe if somebody has been with us in two years training culture, if this means 12 times three days, the person is spoiled for something uh, uh, worth if the person isn't spoiled for for something worse, then we didn't do a good job. Yeah. And many of them organize themselves in learning groups yeah. and go on learning. Mm -hmm. And many of them have other trainings. They've been in Gestalt or in, in, in economical training. Yeah. And there's no, no, no point in wanting to deliver them everything they need for competency. But what we deliver them is a culture <coughs> of learning and of collegial uh, understanding and systemic approach on their learning and then they go wherever they want to go to learn more. We are not so much in certification. We, we, we do not, we are not heading, heading for official certificates of any kind. And we must remember that even in TA, certification is only 300 hours of TA training. Mm. Yeah? And you're supposed to have another 300 hours in your right. profession. Mm -hmm. Mm. And we've lost that and right. mm. mythologized mm. Right. the TA training, four years, five years, mm. six years. Yeah. But I was thinking earlier when you talk about habits, habits of course get stroked. It's one of the reasons we maintain them is they are stroked by the context <coughs> yeah. that we're in. So it becomes so mutually reinforcing. It's a bit like in psychotherapy, there's been a lot written about how in psychotherapy the pathology of the client is stroked by being in psychotherapy mm -hmm. and by the psychotherapist. Mm -hmm. So you reinforce the problem right. rather than maybe change it. Yeah, and if, it's it, the same. if you don't have an open professional culture and a language and habits how to deal, to deal with others from other cultures, then there's a danger that you are caught in a, in a reality bubble. bubble that works somehow, as long as you find clients who pay you for that and believe that's the way to develop. But this is also the way you, uh, your drive is just dying out. So, this is... Yeah? What's the ringing? That bell's been going oh. for a really long time. Oh, oh, right. <laughs> Sorry. It's it's a modeling college. Yeah. There may well be convocation. Yeah. Just yeah. when they all dress up in their, <coughs> in their robes and oh, uh, what yeah. have you and go and get their degrees oh. as a procession through oh, town. Okay. And, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. They really celebrate and we don't when I got my doctoral degree, I went to the office uh, of the professor yeah. and said, What's your name? Oh yeah, the sheet of paper. Oh. That was it. <laughs> the British people know how to celebrate it. <laughs> well, we know ritual. <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah. Maybe the Germans, after the experience of Nazi time, they don't dare to have rituals. They're, st they're starting again to develop rituals. <laughs> so, systemic approach. We say systemic, like coaching, is a container term. This means it contains a lot of different perspectives. And here are some of them. Uh, I, in the metaphor of a mobile, mobile. mobile, we thought in the beginning we are so genial, we look how the mobile moves, and, uh, and then we point, uh, uh, we try to make an impact at a point that 
the mobile doesn't counteract our impact, but um, uh, exaggerate it. So we are very genial to find this point, understood how the mobile is working, and then we make a big impact. Sometimes it works. <laughs> but one day, one of the images uh, stayed with me. Somebody said, oh, yes, if there is an apple and there is a globe, you certainly can say the apple is attracting the globe as the globe is attracting the apple. But the influence of the globe is much higher. <laughs> so we have been grandiose also in the, in the first years of systemic approach of, of what we can do. And it was this was in, especially nurtured by our successes with anorexia. Because our families, systemic families, therapy with anorexia, Milan group and these things, really had and in, in psychotic family really very often had uh, astonishing influences without working psychodynamically. So for some time we thought that's it. But it's with all new uh, tribe, uh, um, all new, uh, is how you say, uh, when a plant is ha having a new shoot. 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 shoot, with all new shoots, it's it was overemphasized for some time and now, and we have integrated it. At least at our institute, there are still systemic institutes are very much in, in this classical only interactional part without understanding systemic dynamics within the personality. We have developed models that can be used as well for the intrapersonal dynamic, for the encounter dynamic for the team dynamic and the organizational dynamic at the same time, so that we do not have a gap in the explanation system. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, I don't understand this mobile. Huh? Can you give an example of this mobile? What is that? I don't understand that. The first one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if you have... Uh, on the organizational level, for example, uh, if if you have uh, let's say the second the second layer of the uh, in the hierarchy, and you have somebody you have you can influence very easily, but if you ask this person what usually happens with efforts this person is doing on the system, you know that if he comes up with something new, the system will counteract it, and in the end it will be flat. <laughs> so this is a part of the mobile. Even if you can easily have an impact on that part of the mobile, if you want to influence the system, uh, does not give you a chance to influence the system. So this is why you have to f uh, come to an hypothesis. Who in the system, or at one point in the system, if you can make <coughs> some difference, this will uh, influence others, and they will react in a more changing way, not in a in a outbalancing way, mm -hmm. and hoping by this mm -hmm. that uh, development uh, is a self, gets a self-organized <laughs> dynamic. Okay, it's a timing with which we need to make the impact. The timing? Timing is one aspect of asking where and when uh, to uh, have an impact on the system. Mm -hmm. And you can do that the same, the same way in personal work. Mm -hmm. And this is classical thinking. If you if you think um, uh, you inform the adult, mm -hmm. but you know as soon as the uh, adult really tries to relate to things are uh, defended by taboos or other things, the system will counterbalance it. So you have to think about where to intervene in order to create a movement that is uh, moving forward by itself. Mm -hmm. Is that clear? Yeah. So that's the kind of structural understanding of which structures are interrelated with which other structures. Mm -hmm. So, Kitan, behind you, in the window, is a mobile. Oh, yeah. That's in my Do you touch the red one? Okay. Is this where you intervene? Or if you touch right at the top? Okay. Well, maybe the movement is different. Right. Okay. So, the green oh. one or the... Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We need to close them. Can you close the last session? Because of the light. And one of the consequences of this approach is if you if you have a, you expect to have an impact on a system, it's not enough to make clear how much you can have impact on a part of the system. You also have to think about whether the interrelationships are mm. uh, and not just expect something will happen in the system when something happens at the mm. point of intervention. Mm -hmm. It's just to create attention mm. uh, for this. It's not giving you answers, but it's creating a sort of questions you, you have to answer when you uh, require that you are a system therapist. Mm -hmm. <coughs> then with the systemic label is also uh, attached, there are some attitudes. This is the attitude uh, of resource oriented. You do not look so much what are the, what is the history of failure, but you look what are the non enough used resources in the system. You are not looking for how it is not working and how can we repair that. You are more looking for what is the solution that is needed and what can we do to set up processes to head for this solution. And if this works, the system loses interest in its pathologies. If you need to uh, deal with pathology in order to find a way to solution, that's okay. It's not saying we, we are not allowed to look for pathology. But the first priority is, does it help to find solutions? Not does it just put away pathologies? And, and from this point of view, you certainly have to ask, who wants which kind of solutions when? So you have a lot of questions around that. For me personally, and that's uh, also quite common in the systemic approach, it was not in the classical strategic approach, for example, the Milan group, they, from a one-up position, they made paradox interventions, they knew what, how to do that. We did it for years and it worked somehow. I changed. Uh, I'm coming from Ericsson school and I have friends who developed hypnosystemic approaches, and the older I grow, the more I have a deep respect from the wisdom of the other systems. So I today work on a basis of not knowing in the beginning, building up a study group <coughs> with the one I work with, going to a learning conversation. I always say you, it's no problem to start stupidly. If only you learn a lot very quickly. So, so the, on one eye level, uh, and this has to, for me to do with really to address the responsibility of my partners and not to bring in all my competencies, even uh, giving an advice if that's appropriate, but also telling very clearly what I need from the other person to contribute as uh, in order to come to an impact, and if and then we have to bargain on that. And I, I personally, this is a question of style. We will talk about style a little more later. I never work when I do not have some kind of idea what we are, where we are going. I, I never pretend that I'm understanding when I do not understand. And I have the attitude: okay, maybe I'm t too dumb to understand. That's okay. Then we have to uh, end our contract or whatever, or you have to give me information I need to understand, but I'm not willing to perform anything unless it's plausible to me and I have some kind of understanding what we are doing. And that's, and especially in the organizational field, that's contrary sometimes to the attitude say, if I don't understand, I pretend that I do understand and I pretend that I do know about solutions, even if I don't have any idea where we go. For me, that's not my ethical position. 
So an important thing for me is systemic didactics. This means um, systemic learning me has a lot to do with the didactic of learning settings. And it's some uh, the most feared questions also uh, with our, part uh, our participants present us. If my boss asks me what is systemic, you know now you have been at that program. And this scares me, as I said, this scares me as well. I don't know what systemic is either, but I tell you what I usually tell people if they ask me. And I tell them, oh, we are sitting together, we work on uh, concrete controlling issues in prof professional world, and we do it in a way we very quickly can learn on several levels. For example, we have an exercise. There are subgroups with four. A is presenting a problem, B, C and D could be the people who serve by consulting. B, C and D have five minutes to put some questions to have a first idea about the problem and a way to solution and offer me that. And A buys the one or the other. Let's say B got the job, then C and D has to change roles, because from now on they are no longer competitors to B, but supervisors to B. They have to change roles, and this does not only uh, mean to change topic, it means to change your whole personality organization to a different goal. And sometimes we have, uh, it helps people that they change their seat position to anchor these changes. Then B is doing the consulting and C and D doing the supervision for B. Then all of them change roles and discuss, uh, uh, and discuss um, uh, whether the consulting went well or not from a colleague's standpoint, leaving the roles of consultant and they look at my former roles as a consultant or receiver of <coughs> supervision. Then they again leave and uh, they give each other feedback whether A had a good way to state his problems uh, about the offers B, C and D did and why they choose to offer their services in this way because Marketing is an important part of professional competence. Then A gets feedback whether he has bought right. Why did he buy B's offer only because he offered to be so emotional and A loves to be emotional instead of hiring C who had an idea to, to have a critical look at emotions. So A learns something about his role of a purchaser of services. And remember, the people in our groups have different roles. They are bosses, they are purchasers, they are deliverers, and all that. And if we have discussed all these levels, then we go on the next level and think about the learning experience we had right now, the changes of roles, of focuses, the management of time, and, and, and. And this is systemic didactic. You learn more by the way we learn than through the content, the content we learn. And usually people react, react on that, oh, I understand what systemic is. Mm -hmm. It's a virtual system. Pardon? It's a virtual system to work. Yes, yes. And they, they, their habitual question was, could you define mm -hmm. systemic for me? And then you, even if you, come up with a definition, it doesn't say anything. Mm -hmm. If you tell that short story about our one of our didactic systems, they immediately understand. Mm -hmm. And this has, and by this you, you say systemic is our culture. As since years I've written about TA should be our culture, not ego states. Mm -hmm. Fourth point, uh, to take it very seriously, is that reality is the reality of the observer. 
that in, in light of a different viewpoint of observing, the thing is a different thing. So you always have to understand who is the one who observes, what is his culture, what are his interests, uh, in order to understand how then reality is defined for the actual situation. This is a constru constructivist's part of systemic thinking. And we do this uh, in mutual considerations on personality, on encounter between personalities within the framework of a context. And certainly in organizational <coughs> con context also uh, not deleting content of, of everything. So we are not, point six, we are not habitually focusing on motivations. That's classic. That's, that's how children design psychology. They ask, why is this person doing this? As if this would be the most interesting question to think about change. It's not. Uh, and many psychologies have the same impulse to ask for motivations, and if they do not understand what a person is doing <coughs> in the system, they, they think they did not understand all motivations, and they come to hidden motivations. As hidden drives within the personality, but what might be hidden is are just habits of the one department and the other departments who, who encounter right now. And it's they're creating together a problem, but how this problem can be decided is not a question of individual motivations. You need it's to ask. like the, Na the NASA project, wasn't it, when the Americans and the British were mm -hmm. um, putting up something into space, and one was working in inches mm -hmm. and feet, and the other was working in centimeters. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't fit. Right. But nobody would ask the question. Yes. They, you know, worrying about the relationship. Oh, right. Really. <laughs> <laughs> And the other thing is, this is uh, by motivations and biography. We sometimes use that, but not in the first place and not habitually. Instead, we ask for meaning. What does it mean what we observe? And certainly to the observer. And if we describe it that way and have, have ideas to change, it along with our descriptions, what are the consequences? Uh, and are the consequences uh, real? And are the consequences acceptable consequences? And this has much to do with be, being focused on present and future and not on past. So, um, then, you said that not only asking the question about um, why does he do this? Rather, ask the question... Not habitually. Yeah, so and to instead ask the question, um, what, does, what meaning does this have yes. for me as an observer and yeah. for the person within the organisation? Yeah. What does it mean? Yeah. What meaning does it have to right. that? If you do it like this, do you have any idea what images this creates in your partner and mm. what he then does relating to his images? Right. And I'm not interested in, in why he's, he is uh, inviting into these images. Mm. Uh, this might be interesting, but much more interesting in understanding how these presentations elicit reaction to the, from the other person that again elicits reaction from myself and how we then get into a circle of creating a specific kind of reality. Mm. But like, so like, like the exercise we just did before, yeah. For example, yeah, yeah. that's, that's, that's yeah. A, a setting where you learn to understand this. Yes. And how you ask for it. Mm. Not the story. Yes. Mm. Is there something in there too around unconscious <coughs> process? Yes, we'll, yes. we'll come to that. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, this is not, not at all uh, designed to be only on conscious levels. 
Sure. All these questions are certainly on an intuitive level and unconscious level as well. But unconscious, uh, again, does not mean related to motif, motifs mm. or bi biography. Unconscious means not being aware of consequences. Mm. Yeah. That's a, mm. another understanding of unconscious. Mm. And the here and now. Yes. Yeah. Can you repeat it? The conscious and unconscious? Mm. Uncon usually the habitual psychological interpretation pattern is this person is not conscious about motives and they usually are going to back to history. This is also the reason why the person is denying motives because of early drama workers and so on. But unconscious, there's only one way to look at reality <coughs> from an unconscious point of view. You are also unconscious if you say this from your culture, with no, no matter what your motives you have, this produces ideas about what you will do within a different culture. Mm -hmm. And you are not conscious about that. Mm -hmm. This is unconscious too. Mm -hmm. And that's a different way of stating unconsciousness. Mm -hmm. And by this certainly all models are examples. Mm -hmm. uh, Eric Byrne developed TA by drawing finding graphics for his intuitive understanding of situations. And this had to do with his professional situation, it had to do with the uh, viewpoints of that historical phase and so on. And so he came up with a lot of good ideas that fitted the situation. And to do, to do we are in different situations. And, and certainly I never use um, sentences like, where would you put intuition in the ego state model? I think the ego state model is nothing you can put anything in. Mm -hmm. If Tell me what you mean about intuition, and then we can think about whether the ego state helps me to understand what you are telling about. And if not, I do not use the ego state model for what? So, the, the reification of models is one of our mental handicaps we have. And this is somehow trained by use of la habitual use of language also in training groups. And so we should be very aware of the, of the ha habitual <coughs> culture, cultural elements we develop, because you, unless you are very much aware on this, you just, it creates an understanding of reality and it creates this reality when several are believing in the same system, not aware that it could be totally different at, at the same point. <coughs> so, models are not answers, but organized questioning and assuming. And so, whenever you, somebody comes up with a model, I can ask him, what is that what you try to to ask by coming up with that model. And then we can think about and w uh, for what difference that makes a difference, that's Gregory Bateson definition of information, what, differ what difference would it make to work with this model and is that the difference that is really useful? And if not, we are going for a different difference, then we may be have to adopt or to develop a new tool. The concept is a tool to come up with this difference. So always be aware of uh, how you create reality with models. And this is a kind of meta-professionality. And this has to, and certainly if you're an organizational consultant, uh, there, you, you, there are other models that preferably come up as if you were a priest or something like that, or someone like that. It has to do with your profession, it has to do with the context, it has to do with the organizational and historical background. So that's this, these seven points, and I guess some more, uh, are in the container systemic approach. So it's not one button, I'm now a systemic uh, model. Yeah, well, one one attitude uh, from our 
clinical and following back the roots, psychoanalytical roots, is believing that if I cannot make my ideas plausible, it has to do with uh, that something is hidden and I have to, to um, discover it. But it was Eric, uh, it was Fritz Perls who said one of the most difficult things is to see the obvious. <laughs> so most of the things are not hidden. We are on the wrong observation perspective. If we change our observation perspective, they can be seen easily because the light is different and then the shadow and light differences that make a difference to uh, give me an idea what it is about I'm looking at is easier. It's a problem if I stay with my point of view and I think that I do not see the differences that are plausible to me. This has to do with somehow it's hidden. It's not. Usually it's not. So, change in professional viewpoint, uh, competence are changes in the possibility to take different viewpoints and understand what you see then. And this very often does mean to step back, not to get closer. If you get closer, you think it has to be in the personal history, if not there in the uterus, and if not there in past lives. It must be somewhere in this channel. <laughs> And then you can create myths about what might be there that somehow explain to you your situation, but that's a very limited thing to do. I've been doing um, some thinking and writing on uh, the concept of uh, cognitive apprenticeship, which is an educational pedagogy and learning science around... Uh, cognitive, would you say that? Apprenticeship. Apprenticeship. Okay. apprenticeship. A cognitive apprenticeship. Which is, this work, yeah. um, it's in uh, yeah, master and novice. Yes. Master yes. and novice. Apprentice. Hmm? Apprenticeship. Uh -huh. Cognitive being that we're really aware that we enter, like we are sitting here. Okay. It's kind of a cognitive apprenticeship yeah. model where yeah. listening to you as the master. Yeah. The master, novice, master, master, do you know the secret of life? Certainly. Master, tell me. It's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> I've been thinking about it a lot because there's one, um, you know, Master Po, yes, Kung Fu, Master yes. Po and Young Kane, yeah, and uh, Master Po says, is he, is he a Zen master? Uh, no, uh, there was a TV program years okay. ago. Oh, I, know, Kung I don't Fu, know that. Yes, the master used to call him Grasshopper, mm -hmm. and he said, um, "Can you see?" What can you see? And he yeah. said, I can see the trees. Um, can you feel your heart beating? No. Um, can you see the grasshopper beside your foot? Yeah. Old man, why is it that you see these things? Mm -hmm. And the master says, young man, why is it you do not? <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's quite a, um, a nice metaphor around yes. what, you know, seniors yes. teach, you know, that whole right. thing around supervision right. and yeah. trainers and actually create something around yeah. being able to see things. So right. that kind of meta right. perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah. yeah, and always to to be relative on your viewpoints. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Master, now I found out what detachment is. Oh, I feel so wonderful about detachment. Detachment is so great. I will go on my life only with being aware of detachment. Master knocks at his head and says, Oh, Master, what are you doing? I detach you from detachment. <laughs> <laughs> term that I think we do in TA all of the time. It's how we learn. It's from, mm -hmm. you know, from masters. We, right. And it's how I earn 
taught around, <coughs> yeah, he was revolutionary, wasn't he, around bringing yeah. the patient into the room while everyone yeah. discussed yeah. that is their care. And that was a cognitive apprenticeship right. about. And I, so that's what I'm writing about, is I think it's intrinsic into how we learn yeah. in yes. TA. We have a, a wonderful tradition on that better than in many other classical schools, mm. but we do do not we do not have a language for it, and we do not identify this as our main points as transactional analysts. Yeah. We never talk. It hasn't been spoken about as part of our pedagogy, our way of teaching. Is mm -hmm. that a type of well, Adrian is yes. yeah. And I just think we think back to Burn. We have to be careful if we have apprentices what we say and what we don't say. Mm. So if you listen to Finita English talking about Burns' way of being a master, he taught Cartman, Steiner and Doucet to fight as rival sons mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. between gotcha. each other. Gotcha. And this has been passed on mm -hmm. and passed on and mm -hmm. passed on, mm -hmm. along with concepts of ego yes. states and mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. through almost every country in the world. Mm -hmm. And we see splits and fights and mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. It's very interesting, so we have to be but terribly it, careful with and you, you, you took the notion of DNA, so somehow a DNA was created and we, we all, we, there still are traces of this DNA within our uh, culture of discussion today, or, or, or our not culture, in order not to come into this bad way of uh, competition. I was going to say, when I read, read the life scripts, <coughs> what I, I heard in that, as a, pro, as a professional in TA, was actually variety that we are, we are bringing <coughs> different ideas and being open yeah. as part of the professional, how you see yourself. Is that new, is that what we're saying to the, has it been much more master to... <laughs> more like a life story. Because I thought that life script... When I read it, I read two articles now these days, I thought, oh, it's really, uh, <coughs> somehow it's, it's uh, uh, arising a new quality of at least uh, putting aside each other's uh, yeah, viewpoints. Yeah, and I can look at... Uh, so, so panel on that was boring. You have been on that panel, no? <laughs> Yeah, I was on that panel. <laughs> they, they, they didn't have to say to each other, but the panel is not a very... Uh, easy to handle yeah. setting for that. It yeah. was more interesting in Craig. But at least in one in one book it's it's yeah. a progress. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just um, coming back to this for a moment though, yes. um, the uh, you talked before about uh, taking getting in and yes. then coming out as a helicopter. Yeah. Um, recently with a client I used um, an analogy of him making himself a director. Yes. So imagining himself mm -hmm. He had a problem and a personal problem. Director in, in sense of the theatre metaphor? Movie, in his own movie. So if he could see himself. Yeah, a theatre or movie director. I use that a lot as well, yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. knowing as a mastery of uh, creating reality is nothing natural. It's always, although we know or not, do not know how we do it, up, but it's always something artificial. It's always creating culture. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I and I use this metaphor for a helicopter to give permission. Uh, if you fly over the landscape, you see, oh, this might be interesting there. Then you go down, then you look around, find, uh, look closer. What is this about? And if you can do something there, do it. And if it's limited, or maybe if you only have limited time, and you might also sh should also go to somewhere else where it's. Uh, more important also to do something that is in combination has an effect. You go back to your helicopter, you fly above, look where you should go else. And so that's a different style of daring to, to, to approach reality and not confronting, working through, making an end to anything. Sometimes these classical attitudes are the right one. It's only if they are perpetual. Uh, So, and uh, one of the mental approaches of this is uh, not to look at things, as I already said, for example, intuition and ego states, these are not attributes of the thing. 
For example, uh, he's playing a game, or oh, this is a record. It's a person behavior within a context. And I'm looking at the situation from the perspective of records in order to find out whether this model as a tool to understand the reality helps me to make a difference that makes a difference. So we are see as if different concepts are in a metaphor spotlights, different arts, kinds of spotlights that I switch on and off. And if I switch it on, in what light is reality sent to be seen? And can we see something, do something different when we use this light? And if not, we switch it off. I was very curious about what you mentioned just now. No? You say, somebody would say within an organization, yeah. for example, this is a racket or this is a game, etc. What do I say it for? Yeah. It, it means, you, you're implying that the question is, if I say it, it may... It, must have some kind of meaning. Yes. No. So I was wondering, do you use the uh, concept of game uh, saying it out loud in an organization? Yeah. Would you ever use it? I do not at all use GA okay. language with clients. Okay. What okay. I sometimes would do is, so, so when I listen to you, I'm not no, sure. I, I, I cannot. I agree 100%, but some people do. Yeah, so I cannot. I cannot. Gr- I'm 100% yeah. It. You're so also, I really am passionate to you. These emotions do not touch me. Mm-hmm. And the TA people say, I usually say, this might be because this is an, uh, an emotion that is some, somehow not at the right place. Mm-hmm. Because in, if it would be at the right place, it give you would it give you orientation <laughs> and will give me orientation. So I introduce the idea of record as um, a replace mm-hmm. feeling mm-hmm. or something like that. Mm-hmm. But I never, I never act identified with J language. Mm-hmm. I think um, there is a massive difference between organizational TA mm-hmm. and TA in organizations. TA in organizations is doing TA, sharing TA concepts inside organizations. Mm -hmm. You cannot see the point Mm -hmm. of that because the organizations already have their own ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. But there is a stable within TA Mm -hmm. that does this. Mm -hmm. But organizational TA is thinking and Mm -hmm. think yourself Mm -hmm. about the organization Mm -hmm. from a TA perspective. This is your thinking frame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's what I'm hearing you say you are. Yes, yes, yes. exactly. Uh, well, at least in, in Italy, this is this is a very uh, meaningful issue <coughs> for me because, uh, at least in Italy, 20 years ago, when uh, TA was sort of being introduced, 25 years ago, and becoming mm-hmm. important, uh, there was a whole generation of people who went into organizations applying. Uh, yes. Yeah psychotherapeutic model without any changes yeah, and, and using uh, games and like And it was it was also a unquestioned idea how change can happen because they most of them, included me at that time, didn't have an idea what an organization is and how it should change. They hoped if I teach UTA you will find out. Mm-hmm. But that's usually not the case. Well, it's interesting because 20 years later, sometimes when I go into organizations, yeah. they say, and I, I have met people who have said, you know, I remember, but it's very strange what you are presenting is completely different. Right. Because we were used well, to... Yeah, we often meet people who say, oh, TA, I know, three yes, exactly. mm-hmm. and then they finish listening. Yes, yes exactly. exactly. <laughs> that's exactly. too pity. Yeah. So that's because I do yeah. not say I'm a TA person. Yeah. Is there a, a TA trainer, organizational TA trainer, right on a LinkedIn discussion recently mm-hmm. that it's only TA if you teach TA inside the organization? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like this is the old way of yeah. Way, yeah. way, yeah. Okay, they are come to an end because we'll stop in two minutes. So these uh, these perspectives, uh, scientifically spoken, are not tied together to a consistent system. It's not a system of <coughs> looking at. It's a catalog. This, yeah. yeah. This means it's not very clear 
how the different perspectives are related to each other. And we have, do not have to clarify that a lot. We just adopt a spotlight and see how the object is, can be seen in this light and then think about whether we can do something with that or not. And it's important that the spotlights are not habitually uh, um, linked together that you have to switch off and on each one separately. This uh, brings the necessity to think about which spotlight you use. So no habits on this level as well. To stop, I have 30 seconds. Uh, I, I tell you a wonderful experiment I've heard about. There have been five monkeys in a cage. You know that? And they put a banana to the ceiling and some bags down there. And as soon as one of the monkeys thought, oh, a banana, puts a, how do you call that, cage or whatever, whatever. Box. boxes, the boxes, make a stable of boxes, I can get the banana. Not, no, not difficult for the monkey. But as if, uh, at the moment the monkey tries to do that, um, they poured cold water on the other ones. And after several rounds, rounds whenever a monkey wanted uh, to pile up the boxes to get the banana, all the other monkeys <laughs> prevented this <laughs> not to be poured with cold water. So this is over and over again. A culture was established and it was clear that no monkey will ever think, even think about a banana. The banana is just not there. Then they exchanged the monkeys. And they took one out and a new one in who didn't know the culture. As he saw the banana, he saw the boxes, and the other ones immediately catch him and make clear to him that he should not, without being poured with cold water. Mm -hmm. And so they exchanged all the monkeys. And still, it was very clear that in this cage, a monkey will never go for this banana by piling boxes. And this is a very interesting metaphor about developing organizational culture. Mm. Although the events creating and, and making this culture plausible are lost in the past. Mm. Nobody knows why. But, but it's very stable. Mm -hmm. Taboos have been created. I like this metaphor. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.